Before we get started today, I want to take a moment and recognize all of our great sponsors and a special thanks to the members of the Mac Baldridge Society who serve as trustees to the Foundation's Institute for Performance Excellence. Today's topic is focused on a system for excellence in healthcare, and our panel of speakers will do a crosswalk that integrates the Baldrige criteria for performance excellence and strategic management performance system frameworks. Today's webinar serves as an introduction to the upcoming live online Mastering Strategy in Healthcare Bootcamp, co-sponsored by the Baldrige Foundation, George Washington University's Center for Excellence in Public Leadership and LBL Strategies. The bootcamp, Mastering Strategy in Healthcare, is targeted to senior leaders in healthcare and will be delivered over 10 half-day sessions from October 25th through the 29th and November 1st through the 5th from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. You can visit LBL Strategies website or the foundations to register. Here is today's agenda and featured guests. Our guests include Randall Rollinson, President, LBL Strategies, Tamara Fields Parsons, President and CEO of the Tennessee Center for Performance Excellence, and Doug Maris, LBL Strategies Vice President of Operations. Following their presentation, the moderator will take questions from the audience and we will have a panel discussion. That presentation will be followed by brief updates from the Baldrige Performance Excellence Program, the Alliance for Performance Excellence, and Communities of Excellence 2026, along with a few closing remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll turn it over to Randall to get us started. Thank you all. Thank you, Al, very much for having us today. We've been looking forward to this for some time. Uh, I will uh, get us going here and then I'll be handing it off uh, first to Tamara and then to Doug. So who we are, what we do, uh, we are a full service strategic management education training and consulting firm. We're located in Chicago. Our focus is to help our clients focus and make better decisions by helping them think and act strategically. We are a registered education provider of the Association for Strategic Planning. We prepare people to sit for certification as strategic planning professionals or strategic management professionals. Our partner is, as, as Al mentioned, the Center for Excellence in Public Leadership at George Washington University. Uh, we are a veterans owned small business. I'm, a, I'm an army veteran. And we are members of uh, the Project Management Institute, ASP, and the Association for Talent Development. We have three primary offerings in our educational work. We have a certification program in strategy management. Uh, we have a boot camp in scenario-based planning. And we have another certification program in agile organization design. These two of these three programs are uh, certified with through GW, uh, we have the mastering strategy program is offered in person, online, self-paced, or a hybrid version, and then the mastering agile org design is uh, is offered in person, online, or hybrid. So, where did this uh, webinar come from? Where did this idea come from? Well, um, it really came from uh, an invitation that I received just. Uh, you know, just before the pandemic hit, I was invited by Tamara to come to Tennessee and speak at their conference. And I presented five tools and uh, several of those tools we're gonna present as well today, uh, strategy management tools. And they were at that time targeted to the public sector. Um, so that was the emphasis at that time. After the session, Tamara and I had a chance to sit down and, and, and get acquainted a little further. And we began even, even then to talk about the similarities between the Baldrige framework and the, and the strategy management profession. Both of them focus on achieving tangible results. And it was just maybe a month or two after that that we got together online and began to partner. We put the Baldrige framework and criteria up and then 
the learning objectives and content of, of the strategy management course. And we began to see, well, how do these things intersect? It was shortly after that that, um, that Tamara introduced me to Al and other members in the Baldrige family. And we began seeing these connections, this crosswalk actually come to life. Uh, earlier this year, I was invited back, which is always a good sign, uh, to make a presentation on planning for resilience, uh, really building off of the new Baldrige criteria that, that address resilience. So that, that took our understanding, that took our collaboration a little further. And then again, um, once um, the conference was over, you know, Al sent me the full Baldrige, uh, new Baldrige 21-22 framework, and we redid, Tamara and I put our heads together, and we updated the framework. And then lastly, um, this led us to, okay, what if we do a webinar that really lays the groundwork for this upcoming boot camp. So that's how we got here. There's, there's just been some kind of serendipity along the way, uh, some insights along the way, and we're looking forward to sharing that with you. The way we wanna position this um, is that the Baldrige framework does a fantastic job of the criterion that organizations must meet in order to be uh, excellent in order to achieve excellence. It's non-prescriptive and it's very much a systems perspective. Similarly, <clears throat> our work here related to strategy management, I was one of the authors of the body of knowledge for the ASP certification exam. So we have spent 35 years studying and applying these tools. And what we began to see is Strategy management is about a process to achieve excellence. Criterion to achieve, process, uh, the criterion, and now then the process to achieve. Our approach is generic. It begins with looking, assessing, and organizing, you know, where is the organization? What's it trying to accomplish? Moving into an environmental assessment where we look both internally and externally and prioritize, uh, lay out in phase three, uh, the kind of the direction we're headed, the strategy we're going to pursue. With a strategy that we're going to pursue in place, we can put together a strategic plan, a strategic operating plan, and here's where the easy work ends. This is the easy part of strategy management, is figuring out the strategy, building the plan, figuring out the metrics. The hard work really begins at execution. In the private sector, somewhere between 60 and 70% of strategies fail at execution. They're either not aligned up and down the organization or for some other reason, implementation uh, begins to fall apart. Either we don't remove the roadblocks or whatever it might be, but this is where the real value is, is in execution. And then lastly, the cycle is uh, completed when we look at our results, measure our effectiveness, begin to say, what did we learn from all of this? What, how do we need to adapt? And then ultimately putting in place an ongoing, what we will refer to, and Doug will talk about, it's a strategy management calendar, calendar to manage the process. This is all presented in this graphic and actually in the course in a linear fashion, but we all know that in the real world, it's iterative, it's back and forth. But this is a process to achieve excellence, unlike the criterion required to be excellent. So together they form a nice package. So we put together this crosswalk. Uh, I'm going to put a link here in, in, the, in the chat uh, as we go uh, that you can pull this up on your screen. So I'll do that in just a moment. But this is an introduction to it, a system of excellence. And the, and the crosswalk looks something like this. What you have across the top are the seven areas of the Baldrige criteria. And along the, 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 uh, the, the vertical side, we've got the six phases of strategy management, and then those tasks that I just went through. And you can see in each one of the cells, we've identified where does the strategy management framework match up with the criterion included in each one of the cells. But I do wanna move us now to um, uh, talking about 
how this applies to the healthcare world itself, healthcare examples. So we're gonna show you five tools now. My business partner, Doug Maris, who leads our work in healthcare, will present uh, first a tool called scenario planning. Uh, then we'll talk about the strategy canvas. Um, we'll talk about strategic planning, uh, the, uh, the strategy map, the, 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 that's a powerful tool to use for strategy work. We're going to, he's going to talk about something about OKRs. And then lastly, the strategy management calendar. Doug, it's all yours. Okay, thank you, Randall, and a good day, everybody. And um, as Randy has said here, this is our framework for the Mastering Strategy Certification, which we offer through George Washington University. But we like to say that we thrive at the intersection of theory and practice. So this is not just stuff we teach, it is stuff we teach, but it's also what we use as we come alongside of organizations to help with their strategic management. And matter of fact, I do just want to give a tip of the hat. I believe we have a couple of our healthcare clients actually who have enrolled in this webinar. Um, we've been honored to work alongside of the Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine um, for the last, I don't know, about two and a half, three years. And I believe some of their leadership is on this webinar and they've graciously allowed us to use a couple of their work product here in this webinar as examples. And then more recently, we've been working since May with the um, American College of Radiology, which uh, represents, I think, over 20,000 radiologists and um, other uh, physicians in the, in the radiology field. So we have um, been working with them and they have graciously allowed us to use a couple examples of their work product as well. So you can see we have these five tools that we're going to introduce in the Mastering Strategy program in the boot camp that we'll be offering in October. Our toolkit actually numbers about 55, I think, tools. Um, and so these are just five that we thought would be especially helpful to present here in this webinar. So Randy, if you go to scenario planning, so you'll see here in the title slide, Tamara has embedded the crosswalk reference to the Baldridge criteria. Um, and so we've done that on each one of these tools. Just very quickly, you can see here's where or how it aligns. So with that, Randy, go ahead. So um, we like to use this graphic when we introduce the concept of scenario-based planning, um, because you can see in this um, cylinder or this cone, uh, we call a cone of possibility, there is a cylinder that you see it's identified as today's perspective. And what that cylinder reminds us is most of us by human nature, when we think about the future, you know, 10 years, 15, 20 years in the future, it's just human nature to view the, the future through a very narrow cylinder of today's perspective. And we just can't help ourselves. You know, we, we think we're being innovative. We think we're, you know, thinking outside the box. But really, most of the time, we view the future very similar as it is today. You know, maybe some advancements in innovation and technology. But for the most part, that's our perspective, is that very narrow cylinder right in the middle of the cone. Well, what we do with scenario-based planning as a tool is that we help organization leadership kind of broaden out the aperture of possibilities of what the future may look like. Now, important distinction here is we are not predicting the future. That's the role of the weathercaster on the news. And even the weathercast, they, they know not to predict much more than three or four days, correct? They, they, they don't try to predict years or you know decades. So this is not about predicting the future, but rather this is about preparing for uncertainty, preparing for the future. And so you can see that the cone of possibilities, what we try to do in scenario-based planning is to broaden out this aperture and who knows what the future is going to look like. I think Yogi Berra said the future, the future is not what it used to be. And with the disruptions and technology and pandemic and global crises and um, the environment, climate change, I mean, who knows what? And so what we try to do is to get leadership teams to live in various scenarios of the future. Again, we're not trying to predict, but trying to prepare what are the capabilities that our organization are going to be required should any of these uh, scenarios come about. And so the, um, the process we use, go to the next slide, Randy. 
we um we like to introduce um trend cards and again this is to kind of prime the pump of those who are involved in this in this exercise uh, related to the various trends there's lots and lots of weak signals that are out there and what we try to help leaders do is to start to pull these weak signals into trends and we've actually created these trend cards that we use and these are specific to healthcare and so trends such as emotional AI, health insurance costs, diversity and inclusion, blockchain. And so each one of these cards just kind of primes the pump related to some weak signal or some trend that is out there. And then what happens when some of these trends start to merge together? Randy, next slide. And so the process we use to create the various scenarios is we help an organization identify drivers. What are critical drivers for your industry, for your organization? And then within each driver, identify um, alternating poles or opposite poles. And so you can see in this example, demographic shifts, a one pole being very minor shifts, a major pole being huge, major shifts. Um, access to healthcare. Whenever I'm working with our healthcare clients, access to care is almost always front and center of the strategic discussion. So one poll is that access is, has increased. Every individual has access to affordable, comprehensive healthcare. That's one extreme. The other extreme is healthcare is um, access is decreased and it's limited based on only the wealthy um, can can afford healthcare. And so. You see the opposite poles. And then technology, um, one pole is that it's enabling unprecedented efficiencies enriching daily life. The other pole is that it's actually replacing um, uh, healthcare professionals and robots are doing most of the healthcare lift. And so, and this is an example of three, we typically use four. And so with four drivers and two alternating poles, that gives us an actually thick various scenarios in which for us to consider and go yeah go ahead to the next one Randy and so this is an example we did with our um, client um, the American College of Radiology and just one of the four worlds that they identified as a possible um, future reality they titled the ultimate radiologist you can see at the top there the uh, combination of the pole the drivers and the poles so in this um, world economic shifts are minor, or, or the demographic shifts are minor. Access to healthcare is um, has really significantly decreased. Technology has replaced multi healthcare professions, and the U.S. economy it's um, it's insolvent. And so you can just kind of scan through the bullet points, and you know we realize this is really stretching the imagination. We're getting very close to science fiction. We realize that, but that is ultimately the goal here is to try to get leadership to lift their gaze out of the day to day. Um, we're listening, we're listening to our stakeholders, we're listening to um, industry experts, and we're listening to the future. And what are some of the capabilities should this world actually come into existence what are some of the capability gaps that we're recognizing now so that we can prepare for the uncertain future? So that's the first tool we wanted to highlight called scenario-based planning. The second tool is Strategy Canvas. Um, Strategy Canvas is the um, tool that was introduced by um, Kim and Maborn. Once again, this um, uh, slide gives you the cross-reference in the crosswalk. Um, Randy, go ahead and go to the first slide here. So uh, a couple decades ago, Kim and Maborn introduced this in some HBR articles and then ultimately in their, um, their well-known book now called The Blue Ocean Strategy. And this is another tool that will help organizations kind of graphically capture where are we placing our strategic emphasis currently in comparison to our industry. And then the tool can also be used to identify where, what shifts, what changes do we wanna make? Strategy is all about change. Strategy is all about choice based on our changing customer needs. So what are the changes? What are the choices that we're gonna make based on the changing customer needs? And the Strategy Canvas is a really nice collaborative tool to get to that. Next slide. 
So go ahead and build this all the way out, Randy. So the example that Kim and Mauborn use is that of Southwest Airlines. Now, this is a couple decades old, but when Southwest Airlines first hit the scene, they decided we're going to be different than the airline industry. And you can see the airline industry curve. They have that compared to their current um, or their strategic emphasis. Now, just to explain the... Um, the graphic here on the y-axis is the relative amount of emphasis that Southwest Airlines is going to place or does place on these various, dif um, on various differentiators. And you can see um, premium price, meals, lounges, seating choice, compared to the rest of the airline industry. So let me start with meals, the second one there. Southwest Airlines, you know, if you fly Southwest, they say we're going to put a lower emphasis on meals than most of our competitors. Um, you know, most competitors, you know, and this was pre 9-11 even, but most of the competitors are providing a very nice. Southwest says, you know, we're going after the vacation traveler. We're going to lower our emphasis on that. Lounges. Most of the major airline carriers have, you know, a nice lounge for their, you know, frequent flyers. Um, I'm part of American. I love going into the Admirals Club and free Wi-Fi and food and, you know, it's clean and quiet. Um, but that's a lot of overhead. That's a lot of cost for the airline. And so Southwest, it's like if we if we're going after the, um, you know, the vacation traveler, you know, maybe we can save a lot of resource by not providing these lounges. So you get a bag of peanuts when you get on the plane. There's no lounge. Notice the next one, seating choice. That's a lot of logistics and allowing people to choose their seat and aisle and row. If you've ever been on Southwest, you know, it's just get on and sit down and shut up, right? The first, you choose your seat when you get on the plane. So notice how Southwest is saying we are identifying some categories that are important to our competitors that we're going to de-emphasize. Now, when we de-emphasize these things, that means we're going to be able to have additional resources available. Notice the one that's circled there to the right for friendly service. You know, we are going to go above and beyond our friend, the service, even, you know, beyond our competitors, we're going to put exceptional amount of emphasis on that. And, you know, if you ever fly Southwest, you realize they do try to have fun. They try to go, you know, just that little extra. They tell you jokes over the PA. My um, my daughter and son-in-law, when they got married, they flew to Southern California and Southwest from Midway, Chicago. And midway through the flight somewhere, the flight attendants got word that they had this newlywed couple on board. And so they had all the people in that little area tie their peanut bags together. And they tied all these empty peanut bags together and they made a veil for my daughter and they put this peanut bag veil on her head as they flew into Orange County, Southern California. Well, you know, you don't get that on Delta, right? I mean, that's, that's a Southwest thing. We're going to have fun. We're going to make it experience. Notice that down over in the bottom left hand, because we're saving all of these resources, we're also going to put a low emphasis on premium price, kind of a double negative there. But essentially, they're saying we're going to be the low cost carrier. And at the time, Southwest, they um, really carved out their niche in the market by being the low cost carrier. I knew at the time I was flying, I was with a, a senior healthcare. Um, regional senior healthcare organization at the time, and I would fly from Midway to Omaha for $39 one way. I mean, you can't drive it for that because Southwest was identifying, you know, if we save in these other areas, then strategically we can pass on some of that savings to our customer, be the low, you know, be the low cost leader. We can put more emphasis on friendly service and additional emphasis on turnaround time. And this is how we're going to differentiate ourselves from the industry from the competition. Now, Randy, go to the next slide. So this is um, an example that the starting point for this is with the American College of Radiology. So I appreciate them allowing me to use this, even though I have really changed it up a bunch since kind of when we did this work, partially just to kind of protect um, some of their discussion, but um, also just to kind of illustrate some other points that I wanted to make. So you can see, and I realize it's really fine print there in the bottom, but you can see some of the categories that um, a medical specialty association may compare themselves to the industry or to the competitors. The first is advocacy. Um, the other is OME education, um, safety. Um, you can move on down technology. Um, informatics. And so you can see here's some areas that we are um, emphasizing 
and some areas that we're not emphasizing. And notice the yellow says as is. So this is where the leadership team comes together and says, right now, this is our current level of emphasis in these categories. Okay, Randy, do one build. Okay, so the red here, the red then, that's our competitor. And so we're just comparing ourselves in these categories um, up against you know, some of the other medical specialty associations. So we all put about the same emphasis on advocacy, but our competitors are putting much higher emphasis on OME education. Um, you know, where if you move on down, you see quality and safety, we're putting a very high emphasis on quality and safety, whereas our competitors, not so much. Um, technology, this has been maybe a lower emphasis where our competitors are, are much higher. And, for, and so you can see, here's how we're comparing up against our um, industry or against our competition. Randy, do one more build. And then the discussion then naturally moves to the blue line, which is our to be. So if the yellow is our as is, the blue is our to be. And so what strategic shifts and emphasis do we want to make? So Randy, just click one at a time, each arrow. So you can see in advocacy, yeah, we put fairly high emphasis. We want to go even higher, of uh, even greater emphasis. Click. And over here in technology, a greater emphasis. Okay, go ahead and build this out, Randy. You get the general idea how in some of these categories, we're going to increase the emphasis, and in other categories, we're going to decrease the emphasis. And part of the discussion here has to do with resource availability. We just can't increase everything. And so we need to, you know, here are some areas that we're going to cut, areas we're going to decrease emphasis, and then we're going to use those resources so that we can put kind of go above and beyond in some other areas. Let me just kind of pause here. Has Tamara, did, did she make her way back in? Have we heard from her? Yes, I was able to join back in. I lost Wi-Fi for some reason. <laughs> Sorry. All right, Tamara, I think I'm going to pause here. Randy, if you want to go back to the crosswalk, because I know Tamara had some important points that she wanted to make with the crosswalk. Thank you. And I'll leave my video off just to make sure that I maintain a little bit of capacity. Um, so I'll just speak real quickly. Uh, we do have our crosswalk. I want to kind of start out by uh, referencing the actual Baldridge model itself. And when we look at the Baldridge framework itself, that uh, hockey puck or whatever that model is that we call a quick reminder, you know, in, that that organizational profile asks us a lot of what questions, right? It's describing the key factors, the key characteristics of an organization. It's a really good foundation uh, to help us figure out what's important. And I'm sure that it's not hard for you to see how laying that foundation would also be a wonderful introduction into using the strategic management performance system. And when we look at the key categories of the criteria, I'm gonna start a little um, um, out of the typical norm and let's just even look at customers. Some of the questions in the Baldridge performance excellence criteria ask us who are our key customers? How do we listen to them and learn from them so that we know what their requirements and expectations are now and we can anticipate what they are in the future? If we stopped right there, we're already asking ourselves questions that will lead us to be able to identify our strengths and leverage those strengths towards strategic planning and also maybe identify some of our gaps. The criteria is designed to ask us a lot of how questions in the areas of customer leadership strategy, operations workforce and measurement analysis and knowledge management. Also that we can identify and leverage our strengths and we can also identify our opportunities, things that we, gaps we need to close as organizations to help us prepare for and overcome challenges that we can both anticipate and those that might take us by surprise. I say all that as we go into the next slide, because when you talk to organizations that have used the Baldridge framework for years to become excellent, one of the things that that um, it, it's an excellent tool and I am very passionate about it. And those of you that know me know that. What I have learned is sometimes it leads us when we identify gaps or opportunities or opportunities to leverage even a strength, we have to go out and start looking for the answer. You know, the criteria helps us identify those things and even helps us prioritize. 
Um, what it doesn't do is tell us how to close some of those gaps. And in my work with LBL strategies, I have learned that taking a holistic approach to purpose-driven strategy through the strategic management performance system allows me to have a structure to start to answer those questions. So there's not prescriptive advice within the criteria. It guides me to what my priorities need to be and what my next steps need to focus on. And the crosswalk that we're gonna look at now in the next slide uh, takes me <clears throat> from the specific area of opportunity within the criteria and leads me and connects me to a tool within the system for strategic management to help me start closing those gaps. It gives me a pathway, a purposeful, intentional pathway. And just real briefly, for those of you that are real familiar with the criteria, I wanna give you a couple examples because a lot of times I can make, we can make a blanket assumption that, oh, it's strategy, that's category two. What about all the other categories? The beauty of this crosswalk is it actually touches and integrates every single category. And that's one reason why I found it so valuable. So for example, if I look at category five, um, in 5.1, there are criteria questions in 5.1A3 around how do you prepare your workforce for changing capability and capacity needs? And it goes further into some more detailed questions. There's also a question there in that workforce category around how do you organize and manage your workforce, you know, so that you can capitalize on your core competencies so that you can exceed expectations. Those areas are addressed in the, um, the uh, model for strategic management in multiple places. It's not just one place. It's addressed in the evaluating the SWOT particular tool. It's also addressed in the tools that align behind the strategy as well as implement the strategic operating plan. If I look as another example in operations, so another area, see, I'm not talking about category two, I'm talking about some tangible operations focused results or um, criteria questions. If I look in category six under operations, and I look specifically in 6.2, which is all around operational effectiveness, there's some criteria questions in C2 around business continuity and resilience. How do you, your organization, ensure that you can anticipate, prepare for, re and recover from disasters, emergencies, and other disruptions? The, tool, the tools associated with the strategic uh, management um, program here actually have that embedded and integrated throughout. It's in the uh, first phase that Randall introduced us to around designing and organizing um, your, pro your program. It's in phase two around conducting external strategic analyses. It's also in phase two around um, evaluating the SWOT. And then it shows up again in phase six around learning and adapting. So my point here is that if we're looking for a tool that will help guide our decisions and help us build and embed a structure throughout the organization that not only creates a plan now and for now and in the future, but also integrates all the key elements of the criteria. That's what this tool I have found over the last two years this tool delivers. And that's what's behind the crosswalk. I'm gonna stop there. And I've got some examples that I picked up out of Doug's, um, some of the examples that he shared. And if it's pertinent at the end, I can share them at that point. Thank you, Tamara. So let's come to our third of the five tools um, that we present in the Mastering Strategy Bootcamp. This is a strategy map, was introduced decades ago by Kaplan Norton. Once again, you can see the crosswalk reference. Randy, go to the next slide. So once again, I want to give a tip of the hat to my friends over um, at the Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, part of Ohio University. They have allowed us to share this publicly, and this is their actual strategy map. Now, it is actually under reconstruction now. We are redoing some of this. Right now, we're looking at reformulating some of these strategic objectives. But just in short, if this is a new kind of graphic for you, what a strategy map does is it gives us a very um, a visual way to communicate our strategy. It's a communication tool. And you can see the four perspectives. Um, you can think of those as lenses that Kaplan Norton introduced many decades ago that we want to um, evaluate 
and measure and monitor our strategy, not just through the financial perspective, as important as those lenses are, but we also want to think in terms of that bottom perspective, learning and growth, our overall capacity, some of the things that Tamara just mentioned related to our capabilities, our culture, our infrastructure, our technology. And once we have identified the objectives, the outcomes that need to be achieved within learning and growth, then those will drive our internal processes. And internal processes, that's all the stuff we're doing kind of behind the scenes. Ultimately, and, and this is set up for a mission-driven organization, we want to identify what the financial objectives are, how we're going to be good stewards with the dollars that are entrusted to our care. But notice in all of the value, all this whole strategy then ultimately goes to the student perspective, that's the customer. And ultimately our strategy is about improving student affordability, that should help strengthen student experience. You see the connectivity, we're showing the cause effect connectivity and ultimately driving to enhance the marketability of our graduates. And for a college isn't, you know, that's kind of the highest the highest objective, isn't it? That the Cleveland Clinic gives us a call and says, send us more graduates. Um, the various health systems in Ohio give um, um, H comma call and says, we love the graduates, send us more. That's really what we're trying to do is enhance the marketability of graduates. So once again, the strategy map is a really nice tool to remove us. Many times strategies are just so cluttered. There's just so many moving pieces. There's so much nomenclature. There's so, you know, there's so much noise. People's heads are in a swivel. And getting to a strategy map, I'll never forget Dr. Johnson, the executive dean of HCOM, when we finally got to the strategy map, and it was a heavy lift of the deans and the chairs, a lot of people involved. I remember Dr. Johnson leaning back to his chair and he says, wow, finally, I have headspace. You know, finally, I, you know, it's very clear. Here's what we're trying to accomplish. And then a strategy map like this, go ahead to the next slide, Randy, then can make for a really nice scorecard. And this is the actual scorecard that HCOM used at their last quarterly report out. You can see in the top banner, the high level strategic direction. Ultimately, that's where we're going. The strategy map then is how we're gonna get there. The strategic objectives, notice there's red, yellow, green threshold related to that next column. How are we performing our key performance indicators for each one of those objectives? We ensure that we're measuring what matters most. So there's thousands of metrics in any healthcare organization. Um, but we want a dashboard of what are the most critical metrics that the leadership can monitor so that they can navigate the plane. Um, and then the targets, you know, what are the targets that we've set? And then what's our current performance for the current reporting period? So that's what's very nice about this dashboard is that very quickly this goes in front of the college leadership and they can see very quickly, here's a success, let's celebrate success. And then here are the areas that need, um, need attention. Randy, go ahead, go to our next um, tool. So the next tool we wanted to introduce, OKRs. Um, go ahead, Randy. So build this on out, yeah. So OKR stands for objective and key result. And an objective and a key result, OKRs have actually been around for a couple decades, but they've really been popularized in the last four or five years by Google and other tech companies that realize we need to increase our agility. And you can see that as one of the key features of OKRs is the world is changing too fast. We just can't sit back on these old, you know, smart goals that just, you know, think a year ahead or we need we need a, um, a mechanism that keeps our people um, agile allows them to pivot quickly. And you notice the other features of OKRs, ambitious, measurable, transparent, easily understood, focused on change. You know, OKRs are not just about doing your job. They're about how, what am I doing that contributes to the higher level strategy? Um, engagement is a real fundamental feature of OKRs. And honestly, when our team, we first started Reach OKRs, we read John Doerr's book, which is probably the leading book on OKRs. There's two or three others that are out there. We were like, what's the big deal? It just seems like SMART goals, like 90 day SMART goals. We didn't really embrace OKRs until we started to use them. And then once we started to use them, we realized, wow, there is a real sense of urgency here, a sense of energy, a sense of accountability and transparency as we each understand what is, I know what Randy's trying to accomplish in the next 90 days. And he knows what, you know, I'm trying to focus on and how it's ultimately contributing to the strategy. So we'll spend a lot of time in the boot camp, really kind of rolling up our sleeves and helping leaders um, 
talk about, you know, is OKR something that could be really helpful for your team? Go to the next slide, Randy. So this is just some example OKRs within the healthcare world. Once again, I wouldn't I wouldn't get too enamored with the detail here, other than you can kind of see what OKRs feel like. Notice how tactical they are, how tangible they are. Sometimes they almost feel just like project milestones, and that's fine. Um, interview at least 20 applicants for these openings in the next minute. Increase this by a certain amount by the end of Q2. We're going to do very tactical, very short term. Um, we have a very tight cadence. And like I said, this came out of the software development world where they realize old fashioned, you know, writing a long business plan. And then it, that doesn't work anymore because the world's changing. We need quicker cadence. We need feedback loops quicker. We need to fail faster. And so that's where OKRs came out of. And like I said, we're really popularized um, by Google and other tech companies. Okay, Randy. So this is the last tool that um, we're introducing in the webinar. Like I said, we have about 50, 55 of these, I believe, in the boot camp. Um, but we find this tool to be very, very helpful in the work that we do. It's a strategy management calendar. Go ahead, Randy. Um, and this is just kind of at a high level what we're trying to accomplish with the strategy management calendar. We're just trying to be very deliberate as to during the calendar year, you know, what are the things that we need to do related to last year? Kind of summing up, aggregating the strategic performance from last year. That's in the blue. And then obviously all the stuff we're doing this year to execute on our current strategic plan but then we're also thinking about next year, and that's in the green. So on any given year, we're doing some things that look back, some things obviously we're executing on the current plan, but we're also kind of starting to look ahead as we pivot and adapt and think about the future as well. So Randy, go to the next slide. Once again, thank you to the Heritage College for allowing us to use this. This is their current um, uh, strategy management, performance management calendar. You can see a number of swim lanes. The top swim lane is the executive committee. Randy, do the first build. And so you'll notice there once a quarter, and the first one here is in July, we're doing the fourth scorecard performance report. So that scorecard that I shared a few slides ago, that goes in front of the executive committee once a quarter for them to look at how are we performing related to our strategy. Randy, do another build. And then notice, then the next month, then the executive dean strategy team is to get together and we're gonna talk in more detail, what are the corrective actions for those underperforming objectives? We don't have time to do it at that July meeting. That's just a kind of a very quick overview. Each of the objective champions talks about our objective and how we're performing. But then when we come back together in the executive team's meeting, that's when we're putting corrective actions in place. Randy, go ahead and build out one more and another one. Okay, and so the same thing happens quarter over quarter. We're reporting out, and then we're, we're huddling together with the executive dean's team. What are the corrective actions that we need to put in place? Another build, Randy. Now, you notice the senior leader operations team. They're going to be engaging in what we call lower loop discussions. That's related to the double loop learning model. This is where we're actually going to take some time and look at the performance of each individual objective. Go ahead and build out that row, Randy. So you can see, yeah, go ahead and build it all the way out. You can see month over month, we're just going to take a time once a month or one month, we're going to look at objective number one, enhanced marketability of graduates. The next month, we're going to look at strengthening student experience. So this is where the objective champion really has the time to kind of talk about that objective. What are the initiatives that are driving it? How is it performing? So we make sure, and it's built so that twice a year, each objective, there's kind of a deep dive on each of the strategic objectives. Okay, Randy, another build for that. Yeah, go ahead and build that one all the way out. And you'll notice then here for the executive dean strategy team, this is where we're not only are we doing the corrective actions uh, related to the scorecard, but we're, this is where we're planning for next year. And we tied this into the strategic management performance system, you know, phase two, which is the environmental scan that's helping everybody lift their gaze and look at the landscape. You know, we want to do that in September. And then in December, we're going to be working on phase three, revalidating our mission, revalidating the bid. We don't rewrite it all, but let's, you know, revalidate it and make sure it's still serving us well. And then phase um, phase four there in March, that's where we're starting to work on the next operating plan for the next year. And do we need to tweak any of the objectives? Do we need to tweak any of the KPIs? And then phase five, we're getting ready to put the execution plan in place 
for the following year. One last build on this slide, Randy. And so you can see, and we've, we've been standing up a strategy management office. And so the strategy management office is working behind the scenes to kind of undergird and support the entirety of this calendar. Randy, I think that's my last tool. Yeah, so once again, we yeah, you can go ahead and go. We, I just wanted to say a word about the boot camp. We'll spend much more time on all five of these tools and many other tools in our Mastering Strategy and Healthcare Boot Camp. With that, Randy, I'll turn it back over to you. So thank you, everyone. Uh, please do reach out and get acquainted. We'd be very happy to engage and get to know you and, and so forth. So let me come now to... Um, the panel and uh, hand it back to you, Al. Well, thank you, Randall. I appreciate that. And Doug and Tamara, what an outstanding job. Uh, we've got a couple questions from the audience. And the first one, Doug, would go to you. And that is, what is the true difference between an OKR and a KPI? Yeah, that's a really good question. They're, um, they're very similar. They kind of feel alike on the surface, but they really are different. So a couple things that jump out at me initially is the cadence on a, an OKR is a much a tighter cadence. And so we're evaluating that. The target is usually a 60-day, 90-day target. Um, it's always um, very um, transparent throughout the organization. And it, you know, we may shift it. We may change it after 90 days. Whereas a KPI, those typically serve us well over, you know, a longer period of time. We want to be able to track and trend our KPIs. So those are important. But we're not necessarily tracking and trending OKRs. OKRs are more of a strategic agility tool so that we can pivot fast, we can listen to our customer, or we can get feedback, we can recalibrate, reset, and kind of keep that tight cadence so we can remain agile as an organization. Thanks, Doug. Tamara, our next question goes to you. If an organization wants to integrate the Baldrige criteria and the strategic management tools, what would be a good starting point? Well, I, the, the important, the uh, good thing is it is very, very well integrated. So I don't think there's a incorrect starting point. But if I was setting out anew, I believe I would start, if I already had a feedback report, I would make sure I familiarize myself with my Baldridge or State Award Program feedback report so that I was conscious of my priority um, opportunities and the key strengths I wanted to leverage. But I think even more importantly, I'd want to ground myself in some of the questions in the organizational profile. And I could do that you know, in pretty short order so that I go into the strategic management um, resources from LBL Strategies with a mindset of knowing what my strategic advantages are and having agreement amongst my leadership team, knowing what my strategic challenges are, and at least having a fair idea of what my core competencies are. And then as I went through uh, the multi-step program and through the tools uh, with the strategic management performance system, I would keep my criteria handy and literally start checking off things as I went through it so that I kind of got a two for one by the time I'm done. 